And that's what we do every single Sunday, and it's free. Every Sunday, 6.30 p.m. If you guys want the address, in case you forgot, come speak to people from the Magic House. Yeah. Woo! And now one more thing I want to go over before I get started was recently, this month, in the month of August, we lost someone that we love close to us from fentanyl poisoning. And I'm sure a lot of you guys have lost people close to you. And so what I want to do is I want to put a picture up of our brother that we lost to dedicate tonight to Cody. Hey, Cody. Cody. Yeah. So Cody, this one's going to be for you tonight. Yeah. And so what I want to do real quick is I want you to put your hand up and keep it up high if you've known someone that you lost to fentanyl poisoning. Keep it up high. Okay. Now keep your hands up still. If you've known someone that you've if you've known someone that's died to addiction or alcoholism, raise up your hand. And then raise your hand if you know someone who's taken their own life. Now look around the room right now. Wow. So this is what I want to do. Today I want you guys to open up your hearts and your minds and your souls. Let those people that we've lost speak to us through my speech for all you guys. Because we can be the next person that that can happen to. That's the reality. Because see, not even addiction is killing us anymore. It's curiosity. Because it's in everything. So guys, today, your life is on the line. So today, please, keep an open mind and an open heart to whatever happens today. Because if you look for answers, you will find answers. So let's get tonight started. So my name is Faustin. I got a sobriety date of October 22nd, 2017. And sometimes I know that word God can scare people away. But I know maybe my God's different than your God. Because see, sometimes your perception of God is the problem. It's not God. Because people will use God for power instead of love. That's why some of us say, hey, guess what? Dads suck. It's like, no, your dad sucked. Right? If you got daddy issues, make noise. I know I do. Come on. Woo! Come on. You got it? You'd be surprised how many guys have daddy issues. Right, sometimes we think it's only the women. It's not like that. I'm proof. <laughs> and so today, when you hear the word God, and I say God, again, keep an open mind too. Keep an open mind because, see, God is like a cheat code to life. Because there's two people in this world. I'm going to show you spirituality, and I'm going to show you the way logic works. Logic is you want to get bottle service at the club, so you save $10,000 because that's how much it costs. So what do you do? You get a job, you work hard, you save money, right? Okay, cool. Spirituality is this. I help my friend move. He takes me to the club for free, for general admission. I walk into the club, there's a security guard that wants to check my ID. You know what I say? I go, hey man, I like your vape. He goes, thanks man, I'm sober. I go, no way, I'm sober too. How many years you guys? I said, fine, I go, me too. Then I go inside the club. I go get a cranberry and soda water. I notice the guy next to me is getting a cranberry and soda water. I go, hey man, no alcohol? He goes, no, I got five years sober. I go, what, no, why me too? Yeah. So then this guy says, guess what, where are you at? I'm like, I'm right here on the general admission floor. He says, come up to bottle service with me. So I walk with him, but then I realize the security guard shows up. I go, uh-oh, but then I realize that security guard was the same one from the beginning. So guess what, he lets me ride in. See, that's how God works. Right. You can either do it the hard and long way, or you can do it the God way. And God works through people. So when I say God, that's what I'm saying. So now I'm going to go into my story. And today is step 10. Step 10 is basically step 4 through 9, right? It's inventory daily. If you make a wrong, make it right. Why do we do this? Why doesn't it just work once you do it in the 4th through ninth step? Because... We get emotional hangovers. An emotional hangover is a premeditated relapse. Because you relapse here first, and then you actually do it. Does that make any sense? Yeah. It's like, hey, I'm going to the strip club every Friday, but I'm drinking Red Bulls. I'm good. Uh, no, I'll be doing cocaine off a stripper soon. That's just the reality. But some of us think we're smarter than that, right? I wouldn't do that. That's not true. If you go to the barber shop long enough, you're going to get a haircut. Hello. So here we go. I'm the type of kid that grew up in Orange County who was shy, insecure. I think I'm stupid. I think I'm ugly. I think I'm unlovable. I'm not worthy. Make some noise if you've ever felt like that. 
So because I got daddy issues, because my dad's not around, and he's narcissistic, you know what that's like. Some of you date them, right? But they're different. I could change him. Yeah. Right? right. Captain Sable, what? Hello. <laughs> so I'm growing up as a shy, insecure kid. My dad's not around, so I look towards male attention. Well, maybe you guys understand, right? I just want to fit in. So whatever they do, I do. But what happens is, is I get sexually abused by one of those boys. And if any of you guys in here have been sexually abused as a child, you know what that's like. My foundation for intimacy is by being abused sexually. So to me, because I didn't know what was happening, I actually didn't see it as a bad thing in the moment because this kid that bullied me was finally giving me attention. He finally made me feel important. So as a kid, I was like, well, I never get this at home, so maybe this is something good. But what happened was is he bullied me the next day, so now I'm like, it's my fault. Maybe you guys ever thought that, right? Where you've been abused, but you think it's your fault. So now my mindset is it's my fault, so what do I do? I'm the know-it-all, the class clown. I am the liar and the manipulator, because that's gonna protect me from feeling vulnerable. Maybe you guys get that. So now what I do is I start figuring out I gotta get tattoos and piercings and get in shape. Because that's what's going to fix me. Because inside I felt broken, I felt alone, and I felt like I didn't matter. But everyone else outside of me, I felt like they had it all put together. So I did all this stuff to work out, to be a punk rocker, to be a skateboarder, to be a drummer, to be a hip-hop artist, to be a gangster, to be a hippie, to be a DJ, to be a bartender. All these characters thinking this is what will make me arrive. The problem was is it never worked. It worked for a bit and then it didn't work. So then I tried the next thing, love. You know what that's like, right? She was saying, right, your first love? I mean, I was the type of person, if you looked at my eyes, I'm like, you must love me. I'm warning, I'm warning you guys today, don't, don't, don't look at my eyes. <laughs> so love was this, this idea, if someone loved me, then me being sexually abused as a boy didn't matter, it didn't happen. Because I used to think it messed me up. I used to think that's the reason why no one will love me. So I'll get into a relationship, and then I'm like, I'm fixed. But then what happens is when the girl would break up with me, then I thought she knew I was sexually abused by a boy. I was like, she must see something in me. She must see that I'm not manly enough. She must see something going on that everyone else knows. And so again, I lived in fear, because why? It was my fault what happened as a kid. Remember, I think that. So I change my style, get into a relationship. I'm fixed. Nope, she must know because she broke up with me. Get into ninth grade, get into a relationship, I'm fixed. Nope, she broke up with me, she must know. So at this point, I say, how do I get out of school? So I faked my own death. No. Anyone else do that, show of hands? <laughs> this is two. Wait, I get one? No? Oh man, some of us are sicker than others. So I faked my own death. That band Incubus, you know that band Incubus? Yeah. Make some noise if you know Incubus. So I get this Incubus song, I put a car crash scenario on YouTube, I got a picture of me in the hospital from fourth grade, and it says, rest in peace. And I thought, this will get me out of school. Yeah. Do you think it worked? No. No, because people will go to your house. <laughs> so my, my next idea, thank God this is back then. If I did this now, I'd get locked up. But back then, I told my teacher, hey, I'm hearing voices to kill people. Can I go home? <laughs> What do you think that got me? 5150. You got any 5150s here? Woo! Man. So so I get thrown I get thrown in there. But then once I get out, guess what? I don't have to go to school. So I got my wish. So now I'm not going to school. And then somebody goes, hey man, have you ever drank some alcohol before? You gotta remember at this point, I've been wanting to kill myself since I was seven. I have no confidence. All that feeling of nervousness and anxiousness and depression and sadness and suicidal thoughts going through my head. But at 13 years old, someone said, do you have a drink? I want to fit in. So I said, yeah. That first time I drank alcohol, woo! You guys remember, right? I was confident. I was secure. I felt like I mattered. I felt important. And I felt like my past didn't matter. So see, it was a tool to live. 
You guys are probably still alive today because you drank and did drugs to live. That's what a lot of people don't understand. So there was this thing that helped me live. So I get curious, I start doing drugs. Well, once I get into drugs, because I want to fit in, I became a gangster. Well, what do you guys do? I got my little black book, I'm trying to you know, do some graffiti. They start doing cocaine, I do cocaine, they do crack, I do crack. And guess what's next? The freaky stuff. Uh oh. You guys know what I'm talking about. Where are my tweakers at? Make some noise. <laughs> this is when all the weird stuff starts happening, right? Man, no one warned me. <laughs> no one warned me, right? I'm used to, like, you know, smoking pot. I get the munchies. I smoke meth, everyone becomes attractive. I'm like, what's going on? <laughs> oh, that's crazy. Oh, yeah, yeah. We got some. We got some honest people here, thanks. $20 is $20. There you go. <laughs> meth is meth, right? So, so, so now I'm getting into meth, but see the problem with the meth thing was is now this brought me to this dark place and then now I get molested. So this though messed me up because I thought it was my fault again. It happened to me as a kid, it happens to me as a teenager. Well, I must be creating this because it felt right. See, but again, as a kid, even though you're being abused sexually, there's still physical arousal connected to it. So just because it felt right doesn't mean it's right. I learned that now. Oh, come on. So if you think it's your fault because it felt right, it wasn't. It's called biology. That doesn't make it right. So for me at the time, though, because it felt right, I blamed myself. And so now I'm like, okay, how do I get out of this? Luckily, I get out. And now I got to just hide it. Suppress, suppress, suppress. So now I got shame, I got fear, I got guilt. I think everybody knows, so I gotta hide it. So what do I do? I have to get into a relationship. Because that's the only thing that will make me believe that that didn't happen. So I get into a relationship, and I think I'm fixed, and then it falls apart at 21. She must know that I was molested and abused. Okay, so try killing myself, self-destruct, get fired from jobs. Drinking, doing drugs every day, having 30 grand mal seizures a day, waking up in different places, and then I get into another relationship. So now I think this is the girl that's gonna fix me. Because she's different. Are you ever meet that one? She's different. Yeah, she brought a date to our date, but she didn't know we were on a date. <laughs> True story. True story. <laughs> oh, that's why she cheated on me. Makes sense. Right, sometimes I'm like, I can't believe she cheated on me. I'm like, didn't she cheat on her boyfriend again with you? <laughs> Surprise! So I get into this relationship when I'm 25, it falls apart. I'm in the midst of my addiction, try killing myself again, I'm having seizures, and I'm pissed off at this concept of God. Because I'm like, if God is real, then why do I get molested and abused and addicted and depressed and anxiety? Right? If this God is so real, why does it give my mom, who is the only good person in my life, cancer not once, not twice, but three times? If God is so real, why did he give me a shitty dad that's never around? Hello, puppy. <laughs> and so I'm mad at God because life doesn't feel fair. Now, I want you guys to make noise. Have you ever had that moment where you're like, if God is real, why is this happening in my life? Make some noise. Huh. So I'm in this place where I'm not believing that God is real because my life is hell. Because see, the trauma is not the problem for us. It's how the trauma affects us every single day after. That's the problem. Do you guys understand what I mean? Because see, I was abused sexually by a man. So now I question my sexuality. I think every girl breaks up with me because I was abused sexually. That's the ripple effect. It doesn't go away. Some people say, suck it up. It doesn't matter. Get over it. And it's people that don't listen to us because they think they have to just tell us it's the problem. Because, see, I believe listening is medication. Listen. So at 25 years old, I'm broken. I want to die. I want to kill myself. I'm mad at God. But for some reason, I remember there was one person in my life who was locked up, got out, and got married. Only person I knew that changed their life. And so he read some scripture to me from the Bible. And what I got from it was that God gives his strongest battles to his strongest warriors. Come on. 
And you see, what that meant to me was that I got raped, addicted, abandoned, neglected, depressed, anxiety, codependent, and all this pain was because I was strong enough to go through it, to help other people grow through it. And see, all of you guys in here have the same story. Your pain is your purpose. Yeah. It's because you're strong enough to go through it to help out other people. Yeah. Think about it, because that means everything you went through doesn't go in vain. You guys don't have to die. You guys get to live. You guys are still breathing. You guys are still miracles. Look around this room. This is proof that God is real. Yeah. See, there is a spiritual solution to every problem because logic says there's not purpose to your pain, right? Logic says you should kill that person, but if you kill that person, then guess what? Say goodbye to all the people that you love because you ain't going to be around. And see, unavoidable pain with God becomes undeniable purpose. And that's why, for all you guys here in this room, really ask yourself, what is that thing that you can't let go of, that you can't forgive, that you can't talk about because you're too afraid someone will judge you, use it against you, or you just can't accept it? But see, sometimes it's hard to accept what happened because you're still in the pain. And again, be careful who you listen to. If someone's never been abused sexually, when they were a kid, and they said, oh, it doesn't work if you find purpose in it. It's like, dude, shut up. You've never been through it. Just like addiction, right? Someone says, oh, just stop. It's like, oh, we never thought about that. <laughs> right? We tell them, shut up. Right. Same thing with mental health, right? Mental health. If you have mental health problems, make noise. Yeah. Same thing with mental health, right? People don't realize this is real. This is real. And so a lot of times, too, with our mental health, I've learned is you just got to learn to embrace it. Embrace it. Look, I got social anxiety. I'm speaking in front of all you guys. But guess what? Since I just said it, it went away. Oh. I get depression all the time, too. So if you got depression, make noise. Did I get depressed and I think about killing myself still at times. But guess what? I share it. And now, I guess what? I get the help. Okay, this is a scary one. This one's always the loudest. If you're codependent, make some noise. <laughs> Stay away from us. We're crazy. You cheat on me, I'm coming right back. That was the old version of me. <laughs> I didn't mean to do it. They said it was an accident. The guy, the guy looked like me. Okay, I get it. It was dark in the room. <laughs> accident. It happens, right? Or you're that person. Have you ever been that person too, the codependence? You get into those fights, but you know you're gonna go back, but you still have to like say you're not gonna come back. You know, hey, no, we're done. I'm leaving. And then you're leaving, They're like, no, don't leave, don't leave, don't leave. I can't do it no more. This is it, this is it. And then they let go of your leg, you get to the door, you walk out the door, you turn around, you realize, oh, they didn't follow me. Okay, got it, I gotta use the restroom, that's what I'm gonna say. Come back in, hey, uh, I gotta use the restroom, but we're still done. Go in the restroom. Oh crap, okay, what do I do? I gotta come back out, walk slow. I'm so sorry, I just can't do this no more. Right? And you walk out, you get to your car, and you realize, crap, she didn't follow me. So then this is what you do. Here's a secret. You use the God thing. I come back and I say, hey, I prayed. God told me to give you a chance. <laughs> I know you guys have used that one too, huh? So you see, it's about embracing though our struggles. There's nothing wrong with it. You're not the only one that goes through it. And see, and that's what I've learned about step 10. Step 10 is powerful because step four is your inventory, right? Step five, you tell someone about it. Step six and seven, you look at how messed up you are, right? And then eight and nine is you make it right. So step 10, what it does though, is it's a daily inventory every day to check yourself, right? Because you're stinking, thinking. Check yourself before you what? Wreck yourself? Ice cube. And so you, that's what we gotta do it though, because just because you recognize that you have mental health problems and abuse problems, and you got you know the, these codependents here, and all this pain and this trauma, you still gotta be able to look at it every day because you guys know, right? It doesn't just go away once you do the fourth, the ninth step. It doesn't. You may recognize I'm codependent. You may see that it's your fault, but guess what? Do you think it goes away that fast? No? 
See, so everyone's quiet. They're like, yeah, it does. <laughs> it doesn't. Have you been in a toxic relationship for 10 years and you have one day single, the next day, I guarantee you, it will be another toxic relationship. Sometimes we think, no, this one's different. No. So the step 10, what it does for us is it helps us check ourselves. It helps you every single day look at, okay, was I selfish? Was I dishonest? Did I lie? Am I manipulating? Am I using? If you don't check yourself on a day-to-day -day basis, what do you guys think is going to happen in your recovery? Relapse. Say that again? Relapse. relapse. You'll relapse. And so you guys got to check yourself on a constant basis. So like for me, my codependency, the way I broke it was I went celibate. Did I do good? I think I did. Eight months. But see, this was a part of my step 10. Because I knew, why do I need to be in a relationship? Why does sex have to mean love to me? I had to understand this. Step 10 helps you understand why you do what you do. Because see, I'm not lovable, and I am ugly, and I am broken. So a relationship makes me feel like I'm lovable, put together. But guess what happens? Honeymoon stage makes an insecure person feel secure. That's why you think, oh, I got no problems. And then once the honeymoon phase is over, all your insecurities come back. So you have to work a step 10 to check yourself because you can be sober and still be an asshole. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. You can be sober and be in toxic relationships. You can be sober and disrespectful. You can be sober and a mean person. You can be sober and depressed. And I'll tell you what, I want to be at least high if I'm going to be depressed. So I don't want to be sober and depressed. So step 10 helps with that. So if you got codependency problem, I'm telling you today, make it a thing if you're single to stay single and work on figure out why you need to be in a relationship. Say you're celibate, it works. Sometimes. <laughs> you got some persistent people, right? Where all my 13 steppers at, hello. <laughs> <laughs> See, in my life I used that. I was like, hey, I'm, um, I'm celibate. And the girls would be like, oh, okay. I respect that. And if they didn't, they're like, oh, I can change that. So then I go to my second thing. I go, uh, I'm into guys. And I see if that would work. And they go, Ugh, I'll change you. <laughs> but this is why, guys, you got to be able to start saying no. Not just to drugs and alcohol, but to whatever you struggle with. Does that make any sense? Okay. So I want you guys to start thinking today, what are those things that you need to break the cycle of? Not just your addiction or your alcoholism, that surface we drank and used to cope because inside we didn't feel connected because connection is the opposite of addiction. If you guys want connection, then you guys need to start being honest and vulnerable because vulnerability is what connects us together. But if you can't say what's wrong with you, we can't help you. See, for me, what keeps me sober these past almost six years is you guys. When you guys come up to me and say, hey, can I ask you a question? I go, yes. Hey, I need some help. What do you need? That's what keeps us sober. We have to help each other out. Because right. if you've been raped, you can help someone else who's been raped. Right? If you've been abused physically, you can help another domestic violence person that's been beat. If you got depression, help them with their depression. If you got anxiety, help them with their anxiety. You guys can do that. And if you guys think, no, I can't do that, who says that? Your mind? Your mind is a liar. You know why you have a negative voice? It's because somebody spoke to you negatively in your past and they planted that seed. So ask yourself, who's still running your mind? Because you guys deserve to have love. You guys deserve to be happy. You guys deserve to be free from your addiction and free from your past. All you guys do in here. Don't be another statistic. Stop putting things aside, stop lying. A lot of times we lie because we're afraid that we can't actually live a good life. Because see, being sober is difficult because it's not about just not picking up or using, but you actually gotta try to better your life. And there's a lot of fear in that. Being responsible, that's scary. And if you guys think you're weak, that's a lie. You know what, you guys are survivors. If it was a blizzard outside, you guys would go walk out to get your next fix. Barefoot, no clothes you do it. If someone says, go to a meeting, you're like, oh, my knee hurts, my leg hurts, oh, gosh, can't do that. Yeah. And unless there's a handsome man or handsome woman at that meeting, then all of a sudden, oh, my leg feels better. 
So put yourself first, guys. Put yourself first today. Ask yourself, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this for you guys today. Look, really think about it. Start thinking, why do you think you can't do it? Start thinking that. And then I want you to ask yourself, is that a fact? Or is that just an opinion? <laughs> ask yourself that. Because you guys matter. All you guys matter. Start reaching out to each other. We're not different in this room. That's why I said, who's codependent? People make noise. I said, who has trauma? You guys made it mental. We're all the same. But see, God is the answer. Because he is the gift of direction. He is a group of drunks. He's the gift of desperation. He's a group of dealers. God is the answer to all your problems. I promise you that. Don't let your opinion that you think God is bad take you away from your sobriety. Because maybe your resistance to God is the problem that you can't stay sober. My name is Foster. I've been raped. I've been abused. I've got mental health problems. i got anxiety. I hate myself. I want to kill myself sometimes. But guess what? God keeps me alive. And I can do this because of God and the steps. And you guys can too. Yeah. And see, today, I'm a substance abuse counselor. I got a master's in theology. I got a couple of businesses that I own. I've been on TV shows. I've been on magazines. I've been on podcasts. I've traveled around the world. I got a healthy relationship. My beautiful. Woo! Hello. And all you guys can have this too. You know, I feel just like you do today. So open up, seek help, guys. There's purpose to your life and you matter. Speak up, please don't hide and don't isolate. I'll tell you what, guys, today we're all gonna get sober today. That statistic of one in 10 is BS because this whole room at Lifelines is gonna stay sober and we're gonna live sober, guys. So I love you guys. I'm going to be giving out uh, therapy and counseling for only $10 a month because I want to give back to people that can't afford therapy. So you can do that, hang out with us at the Magic House, and I'm just grateful for all you guys having me here. I love all you guys, and thank you. Yeah. Fausto is so right. When we let light into the darkness in our lives and we are transparent with someone safe, that's when the healing can happen. So find that person in your life, a sponsor, a counselor, a coach.